Welcome to this introduction to the eye, the retina, and vision. I am Ben Shaberman, Senior Director of Scientific Outreach and Community Engagement with the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And this discussion is for people with really any level of um, science background. It's really geared toward a lay audience. And without further ado, let's get started. So first, I'd like to cover uh, an overview of the eye. And in this slide uh, on the right, I have a side view diagram of the eye. And I'll be talking about components from the front of the eye on the left, moving to the right, to the back of the eye. And the first component I'd like to talk about are our tears. And we normally don't think of tears as being a component of the eye, but they play a very critical role in washing away substances and um, debris that could be harmful. You can think of tears as like the windshield washer fluid for the front of our eyes. And tears also play an important role in nourishing the cornea. Now, one, issue with tears, uh, a detrimental aspect of them, is when we try to put treatments in the front of our eye, namely through eye drops, tears can wash them away. So tears can make it challenging for us to get treatments into the front of our eye. Now, the next component, the cornea, is an outer protective coating for the front of the eye. And it's a very clear and fibrous um, layer of connective tissue. Now the cornea also plays a role in refracting light to the back of the eye. And we, when we talk about refraction, we mean focusing light in a place so, in the back of the eye so that we can see things um, well, we can see crisp images. Now as light moves through the cornea, it enters the aperture in the front of the eye we all know as the pupil and the pupil lets a lot of light in when we're in dark settings and it contracts to limit light exposure when we're in brighter settings and the pupil is actually controlled by the iris the expansion and contraction and then after light comes in through the pupil it hits the lens and the lens as I'm sure most of us know plays an important role in refraction as well and it helps focus the light to the back of the eye to the spot that will give us the, the most um, visual detail and the most crisp images. Now the orange yellowish gel in the middle of the eye, it's both gel and fluid actually, is called the vitreous. And the vitreous fills the middle of the eye and helps the eye retain its shape. It can also serve as a channel for getting substances from the front of the eye to the back of the eye. And then finally, after light goes through all these components and, and the vitreous, it hits the back of the eye or the retina. And the retina's role is to take that light and convert it into electrical signals. And that electrical information is then sent over the optic nerve. The optic nerve is a very small cable that sends that electronic information to the back of the brain or the visual cortex. Now the optic nerve, though it is a very small cable, has a million fibers. So there's a lot of um, visual information that's passed along through that cable from the retina to the back of the brain. So diving a little deeper into the retina itself, as we've already discussed, uh, the retina converts light in, into electrical signals. And it, in the back of the brain, in the visual cortex, that information is used to create the images we see. And you can also think of the retina as being like digital sensors in a camera, or if you're old enough to remember when we used to put film in a camera, um, the retina is sort of like the film as well. And the retina is actually an extension of the brain. It's neural tissue. You can th almost think of it as it's the way your brain is getting outside of your skull to perceive visually the things that are around us. 
And what's exciting about the retina is researchers who are developing therapies for the retina may be able to apply what they learn for treatments for the brain and the nervous system because treatments that might work for the retina might apply to the brain and the nervous system since this is all neural tissue. Now the retina is a very thin piece of tissue, only a half a millimeter thick, and it's the consistency of wet tissue paper. So it's very fragile. Yet, very impressively, the retina process, uh, processes more oxygen for its size than any other part of the body, including the heart, the lungs, the brain. So it's a real workhorse. There are um, a lot of functions that it's performing, and it's performing these functions all the time, 24-7. So our retinas aren't only busy when we're looking at things, but they're doing important functions at night, which we'll talk about um, later in this presentation. So on this slide, I have two diagrams. On the left is a side view of the retina, obviously blown up considerably. And then on the right, I have diagrams of a rod and a cone. And in this side view of the retina, the cells that we're usually most interested in and we're talking about are the photoreceptors. And those are the vertically oriented cells toward the top of the diagram. And our photoreceptors, there are two types, rods and cones. And in this picture, uh, the rods are um, cone, I'm sorry, the cones are cone shaped, red, green, and blue. And cones are important for um, giving us uh, the ability to perceive details, to perceive colors, to see in lighted settings, and they're concentrated in the center of our retina, so they're also important for central vision. Cones are really the, the photoreceptors that we use most often in our activities of daily living. Now, the um, rod-shaped cells, aptly rod-shaped, are the rods. Those are the black vertically oriented cells toward the top of this diagram. Rods give us vision in dark and dim settings, and they also give us peripheral vision. Now, at the very top of this diagram is a single layer of cells called the retinal pigment epithelium. And from here on out, I'm just going to call it the RPE. And the photoreceptors are nestled in those RPE cells. And RPE cells play a very critical role, supportive role, for photoreceptors. So they provide nutrition to photoreceptors, and then they also provide waste management, which we'll be talking about in a few slides. The RPE cells also help absorb scattered light to um, enhance the, the uh, visual experience which we have. Now, there are other cells in the retina um, in the lower layers in this diagram. And while they don't actually absorb light, like the photoreceptors, they do play a role in um, our visual experience. They help with things like contrast and movement, and ultimately information from the photoreceptors is sent through these cells for further processing and then sent out through the optic nerve um, to, to the uh, back of the brain. Now, again, the rod and the cone on the right side of this diagram, they're long sensory cells. You can almost think of them as like antennae for light. And at the top of each of these cells is a region we call the outer segment. And the outer segment is the portion of the cell that actually senses light. In the lower part of the cell is the inner segment, and that you can think of as like the engine of the photoreceptor. That's where um, energy is produced, that's where proteins are made, and those proteins are sent up through the cell to the top part, to the outer segment, to bestow the cell with light sensitivity. And then at the very bottom of the cell is the synaptic ending, and that connects the photoreceptor to these other cells that I talked about earlier. So remarkably, 
each human retina, each one of our retinas has 125 million photoreceptors or rods and cones. So there's an extraordinary amount of visual power packed in each retina. As I've already said, rods pro provide peripheral and night vision. Cones give us central vision, vision in lighting, lighted settings, and they enable us to perceive colors and details. Cones are prevalent in the center of the re region, the central region of the retina, the area we call the macula. And for those of you that have heard of the macular conditions like Stargardt disease, Best disease, or age-related macular degeneration, those are characterized by central vision loss because it's the macula that's affected. The macula is about five and a half millimeters in diameter. In the center of the macula is a, an area that's very, very rich in cones. It's called the foveal pit. It's only a millimeter and a half in diameter, but this is where our most crisp vision resides. So when you want to focus light to the back of the eye, you really want to focus it into that foveal pit. Now, remarkably, while we have 125 million photoreceptors, only 6 million are cones. So these 6 million um, cone cells are very, very precious because, again, they're the cones or they're the photoreceptors that we're using most often in our daily activities. On this slide, I have a few different images of the retina, and a couple of the images are uh, normally captured when we go for our eye doctor appointments, especially if we're going to a retinal doctor. Now, on the left side of um, this slide is what we call a fundus photo. This is the big orange disc. And this is the image that a um, eye doctor will see when looking through the pupil at the back of the eye. So when you go to the eye doctor and they dilate your pupils and they're looking at the back, they're looking head on at the retina. And in the middle of the diagram is this darker orange um, circular region and that's actually the macula and the fovea is then in, in the center of the macula. You'll probably notice the yellow spot on the left. That's simply the optic nerve. That's perfectly healthy. It looks a little alarming because it's bright yellow, but this is a normal retina. And then you have some blood vessels on the outer part of the retina. But again, this is a normal retina. Now on the top right of this slide is another retinal image, but this is a side view. And it's captured using a uh, an imaging technique called optical coherence tomography. And this technique uses light to image the um, structure of the retina, again, uh, uh, capturing a side view. Now, in this view, it's actually flipped from what I showed you in the previous slide in that um, retinal diagram. So the photoreceptors and the RPE cells, which were on the top in the previous slide, are more toward the bottom here. And you'll notice in the middle of this image, there's this pit or valley, and that's actually the foveal pit. That's where um, hopefully through proper refraction, we can get light to that foveal pit so you can get the most crisp vision possible. And then finally, in the bottom right corner of this slide is an electron microscope um, image of rods and cones. This is not something your eye doctor um, has in his or her office. This is very special technology, but it just uh, shows you impressive um, images of rods and cones. The rods are the actual kind of light lime green cells um, and nestled within those are the cones, which are the um, deep purple shorter cells in this um, image. So in order for vision to take place, there's a biochemical process that occurs in the retina and it's happening all the time. We call it the visual cycle. Now, this cycle is extremely complicated, 
And I'm not going to go through all the steps of it. That, that's a, an entire presentation in itself. But I want to talk about some of the elements of the biochemical process, and namely the role that v vitamin A plays in making vision possible. And it's vitamin A that we get through our diets that works like fuel for the retina, and its role is to make our photoreceptors light sensitive. And that happens when vitamin A is metabolized, it's processed, much like fuel in our cars is processed. So when vitamin A is metabolized into a form called 11 cis retinal, it's that 11 cis retinal that bestows light sensitivity to our photoreceptors. And what actually happens is that 11 cis retinal binds with a protein produced in the photoreceptors to create a visual pigment. And it's that visual pigment that absorbs light and kicks off the phototransduction process and makes those electrical signals that are sent through the rest of the retina to the back of the brain. So again, the visual pigment is that magical molecule that makes um, our vision possible. And one of those pigments that occurs in our rod photoreceptors is called rhodopsin. If you listen to researchers, um, they often talk about rhodopsin as, as an important component in the visual process. It's a more commonly referred to um, uh, pigment. Now, vitamin A is actually recycled during the visual cycle so that our vision is continuous. That 11 cis retinal, after light hits it, it becomes a different form of vitamin A, but the retina has the power to convert it back to 11 cis retinal so it can be used again to again bestow light sensitivity to photoreceptors. Now, when vitamin A is metabolized, there are also byproducts that are produced that are toxic, that are harmful. Just like fuel in a car, you have exhaust and you want to be able to deal with that exhaust uh, appropriately. And in a healthy retina, those byproducts are cleared in a, successfully in a healthy manner. Now, in some retinal diseases, it's actually the vitamin A metabolites that cause problems because they're not cleared properly. Stargardt disease is a great example of a condition that is caused by the um, unsuccessful um, clearing of vitamin A byproducts. So we're back to a diagram of the retina that I showed you earlier, but I wanna talk about a very impressive and important process that occurs in our retinas every night when we go to sleep and close our eyes. And it's got a fancy name, phagocytosis. But what happens in our retinas when we're sleeping, when our eyes are closed, is there, there's an, uh, there is a regeneration process occurring. And the tips of our photoreceptors, they've been busy all day, they're sloughed off. They're, they're sort of the used portion of our photoreceptors. And our RPE cells actually ingest and um, clear the tips of the photoreceptors. And this is happening every night and the photoreceptors then grow their tips back so they're ready to provide good vision um, uh, the next day. So again, this is a process called phagocytosis and it's an important process that occurs when our eyes are closed. So finally, to close out uh, this discussion of the eye and vision and the retina, I wanted to give you a final thought from Dr. Jose Sahel, who is a world-renowned expert uh, with great clinics in both Pittsburgh and Paris, and he's made the point, and I'm paraphrasing here, that an eye doctor could preserve meaningful vision in people with retinal diseases such as advanced RP by just saving 5% of their cones. And 
while somebody who only has 5% of their cones may not be an airplane pilot or be, be able to drive, if we can just preserve this subset of cones, we can really provide meaningful independence and enable people to do many of their activities of daily living without assistance. So the bottom line is, obviously we're working very hard to get the best treatments possible, but they don't have to be perfect. So um, one thing that Dr. Sahel is working on is a protein to preserve cones. And if we can do that, um, preserve cones, or maybe with a different kind of treatment, replace them, we can um, preserve some pretty meaningful vision for most IRD patients. So thank you for attending this session on the eye, the vision, and the, ret vision and the retina. Um, I encourage you to peruse the Foundation Fighting Blindness website for more information on research and diseases and some of our other resources. And please feel free to send us a question um, if you have one about this module. And you can send that um, to info at fightingblindness.org. Thank you.